2020, the 2020 Fellows Night, bringing a, a, a silver lining to the end of, of the year. Thanks, um, yes. As I think you know, hopefully, for those who haven't been to a Fellows Night before, the format is several talks from uh, members and others from the society, and uh, they're shorter talks, only 10 minutes and then a five minute sort of question and answer session. Um, then we have four talks tonight by Roger Croft, Rachel Paul, Daryl Sawyer, and Katie Strang. And uh, we're going to start off with Roger. Roger, And in the middle, we're going to have a short interlude with a, a photo slide session from Jason Gilchrist, uh, a very, very good photographer. And I, I assume and hope that they're going to be geological photos. We shall, we shall see. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Roger and uh, his, the title of his talk this evening will be Geoconservation in Nature Protection. And by the look of his introduction slide, his title slide, I assume is going to be um, going to concern Iceland. Is that right, Roger? Over to you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I want to talk uh, this evening about some work I've been doing with an international group of geologists and geomorphologists in the framework of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, most of the people in that union think that nature is just about biodiversity. And for the last 10 years or so, we've been struggling to try and get over the point that geodiversity, geoheritage and its conservation is really fundamentally important if you're going to uh, succeed in biodiversity conservation. I'm not just going to talk about Iceland, but as I've been there 30 times, I've got some rather nice pictures from there, uh, like this one at Kathrinta Felt, which was very recently put on the protected list by the uh, Minister for Health, uh, as it happens, because the Minister for the Environment was compromised at the time. One of the issues that we have is to persuade non-scientists uh, 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 that geoconservation is really necessary. Uh, they see the world through the Convention on Biological Diversity and all the targets at the national, regional and uh, international levels. And they have also have this rather strange view that uh, all the geo features and processes are are robust and you don't need to care about them. Fortunately in the UK or well in, in Britain you will all know that uh, we persuaded the nature community uh, many decades ago that that wasn't the case with the Geological Conservation Review. So we're still arguing with these other people that it is essential and we started the process off by defining a protected area, national park, nature reserve, whatever you want to, to call it in any country, uh, it was formally focused on biodiversity. And uh, having some foot stamping moments in meetings, I said, I'm fed up with dot, dot, dot biodiversity, let's call it nature, because nature is all encompassing. And we won that argument. And since then, there's been lots of good research uh, on uh, recognizing that uh, geodiversity is an intrinsic component of ecosystems and of course if we're going to deal with climate change in any way adaptation mitigation then we will have to uh, consider the whole of the earth system. Uh, one thing to me uh, I spent 10 years as the founder chief exec of Scottish Natural Heritage is trying to make all my clever scientists speak of what I call a common language so that everybody else understood and I still uh, get uncomfortable when I see polysyllabic words and polysyllabic phrases uh, that confuse the public. So one of the intentions of our work uh, was to make this guidance that we produced, which is freely accessible on the web, as you'll see later, uh, available to all. In fact, I resisted having a glossary for a long time, but I had to succumb in the end. And one of the things we're trying to do as part of this um, increasing understanding is to try and promote uh, through UNESCO uh, to the UN, a UN Biodiversity Day. So any help from the Edinburgh Geological Society and others uh, to persuade the U U UK committee of UNESCO, all the better. 
So here's the guidelines. Uh, that's the uh, DOI link. It's freely accessible on the web. It's all in English. One of the critical things that I had to fight quite hard about was instead of just talking about how you manage these areas, was to set out some broad principles, a, a set of five key values and then nine principles. And I think this is very important if others than us, if you like, understand that. I mean, the first is the intrinsic value of our geo heritage. If you've ever been to China and seen these wonderful pools and Huolong National Park, for instance, there's plenty of examples back home here in Scotland of that we should look after them because they're there. Uh, whether it's the wind thrust exposures, the uh, <coughs> or, or a sicker point or whatever that we should have it there's also of course the one that all of us know a lot about is the science and education value i've deliberately chosen uh, the site in euro national park in canada where there's generations of research on the burgess shales and what's quite fascinating is with the new minds coming and looking at those new ideas uh, being applied, uh, then we get different interpretations and add to knowledge. A third aspect of the values is uh, to make sure we link to society and how it's evolved in its thinking over a long period of time. So the spiritual and cultural values as epitomized here in the cave paintings in the Royal Natal National Park in South Africa. Uh, the fourth element is the ecological one. Uh, at times speaking to biodiversity experts, they forget there's something called soil and other sorts of substrates. And you've only got to show them a photograph like the one here at Waimango Volcanic Valley in the Tarangiriro National Park to understand that the thermophilic vegetation is purely there in response to the geothermal uh, situation underneath in the hotspot. And finally, and I think this is really a fundamental in the way that we're progressing scientific thinking into policy is to recognize that geodiversity and geo heritage is an important part of environmental goods and services and using the standard nomenclature that was developed in the millennium ecosystem, for instance. Uh, but then we felt that it was very important to uh, apply some general principles. I'm not going to go through all, all of these. I hope you like that photograph. I took that when I was on my undergraduate dissertation field trip looking at ray shorelines in the Canary Islands and went with a couple of PhD students uh, from Imperial onto the top of Tidy to see the sunrise. It's a fantastic sight. You had to walk it in those days. Anyway, some general principles, a systematic stepwise approach to protection. Don't just plunder in there. We've got plenty of methodologies. The knowledge base is absolutely essential uh, that we, um, we apply that. We, I think we've got probably the best example through the GCR in the UK. Recognize the whole range of values, w work with nature, recognize that change is inevitable, human induced change a lot of the time, and the interdependency between geo heritage, cultural heritage and biodiversity. And having persuaded the powers that be in, in my part of IUCN that we had these, they said, well, people won't read that. So we put in bold letters, you better read the stuff about values and principles before you start on anything else. The next part is obvious, of course, setting up a system, a whole lot of uh, what are the key interests, so key stages in the Earth's history, <coughs> using uh, the example here of a GSSP uh, for the Gozhangian stage of the Cambrian in China, for example. It would be really nice, I dare say, as a non-geologist, if the GSSP system could be 
fully developed and be used uh, throughout the world to look at then major structural and tectonic features. I had a fabulous walking holiday many years ago in the Ekaran National Park uh, and saw all of the fold structures of the Alpine Massif. A third element is the types and occurrence and formation of minerals. There's a lovely example here from Mount Painter in the Akarola Protection Area in South Australia. <clears throat> Sprigite, named after a, a famous geologist who discovered it. We should be also protecting rare rock types and rock structures. As a geomorphologist, I'd rather like the idea of the Cambrian Age tillite in Akarola. Uh, representing uh, that part of Earth history, which some of us still call Snowball Earth. We couldn't uh, omit the very important issue of evolution of life. I've just chosen an example from Northern Italy, Blätterback uh, Geopark, uh, which has excellent records of the, of the mass extinction at the end of the Permian. The temporary Earth processes uh, I have the good fortune, I've been to Iceland 30 times now as an environmental advisor, uh, but uh, I've had the chance to see all sorts of things like the Hullerun fissure eruption, which stemmed from the Bhadrabunga uh, eruption under the Vatnajökull ice cap in late 2014 and into 2015. It was pretty scary uh, flying over there in a small plane, I could, you could feel the heat. We also need to think about representative surface and subsurface features. Now, and there are, I had uh, an expert on caves working with us uh, <clears throat> and talking not only about the intact speleotherms like you see in this photograph, but also the damage that you get uh, from people breaking off speleotherms, uh, from caves being uh, too heavily lit and getting the formation of lamp and flora, for, for instance. And finally, uh, records of past environmental conditions. I think this is probably more important now than it ever has been. Uh, if, if we apply the, uh, the, the old adage, the past is the key to, is it the future, we should be saying now in terms of climate change. But all of that may seem grist of the mill to all of, you, all of you, but it's not to people who are running national parks, nature reserves around the world. And that's why we have to spell it out with examples. Even more critical that looking to us is to make sure that we communicate uh, this to uh, the people in the parks and protected areas uh, and in the education system. I hate, I'm deliberately put in the, in the inset there, uh, a snapshot of, of a bridge purporting to uh, be between the North American and the Eurasian plates in the uh, Reckonis Peninsula on Iceland, which of course is total uh, nonsense. And it's very important that we ensure as experts that we get over the correct information in an ex understandable way, like here in the main photograph at Thingvetla, the national park is really for the cultural heritage. Uh, there's the famous parliament site and the Lowberg, the Law Rock, uh, and the important biological reserves in the Vatna itself, of course, uh, resulting partly from the, the uh, chemical cocktails coming out of the ground. But there's also another way of looking at it. You know, we can think of the, the great. Uh, forefathers of ourselves who have been around the world like Charles uh, Lyle. And I really like uh, this quote. I went to see a forest of fossil coal and he was talking about the Pennsylvania beds in the Joggins Cliff, uh, now World Heritage Site on the, on the Bay of Fundy coast of Nova Scotia. But what I really like is what he says that afterwards, the most wonderful phenomenon perhaps that I have seen. And often we should make sure that we show interest and emotion about these things rather than being uh, too technocratic. So that's my brief synopsis of what we've done. There's the link. Uh, I had a team of American, Australian, uh, Korean, uh, Scottish, British, uh, 
Portuguese, Brazilian uh, workers on it. We got funding from the Korean uh, Republic Cultural Administ Heritage Administration. And it's got loads of photographs, 150 altogether, quite deliberately to demonstrate to our target audience what was there. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, we have time for questions. So uh, people, you can unmute yourselves and ask questions or type them out on the chat. Uh, so the floor is there for everybody. Just Can I ask, uh, Roger, um, what's the next stage in this in terms of within Britain or within Scotland? What, what difference do you think it makes uh, in terms of re legislation in, in Britain? Or what can it make? I think we've got a, a pretty decent legislative base. Um, um, in terms of you know the old um, wildlife and countryside act which has subsequently been updated uh, in 2004 with the nature conservation scotland act um i'm much the one thing that worries me is that we've never finished uh, uh designating the gcr sites that are in all the vol volumes um because there is a bit of a view well we've had to do so much biodiversity designation under the habitats and the birds directives of the EU, which will continue, then um, we don't need to do any more uh, GCR type sites. I think that's a mistake and that's a policy issue for the Joint Nature Conservation Committee and the, the statutory agencies. Thanks. What else? Can I ask you a quick question then? Um, funding for this stuff is obviously an issue and um, seeing as it's global, what I've, one of the things I've noticed is that uh, certain countries are very, very good at putting money into these kind of, uh, these efforts. I mean, China's brilliant for its GSSPs and its, its sites. Um, how, how do poorer countries manage this? Or how can we help poorer countries to manage and sustain their geological heritage? I think we need to develop the equivalent for our fields of endeavour that the biodiversity people have ever since the war. So do we have the equivalents of WWF, BirdLife International, the Nature Conservancy, uh, Conservation International? Uh, we don't really figure at that scale. And I, I say that because it's those organizations that have the resource base, both finance and expertise, to go and help in these other countries. Um, one of the arguments that we had um, with our, some of our reviewers was, well, of course, these countries won't be able to afford this. Uh, what you're talking about, uh, to which our reaction was, well, we're gradually developing this cadre of people through our Geo Heritage Specialist Group in IUCN, uh, who would be willing to do that sort of thing. And if we look at the resource base in the research institutions in the academic world around the world, and if you look at the number of papers in the professional journal, uh, Geo Heritage, there's an amazing amount of expertise which, which could be used. But I think it's worth the, the geological community, maybe through the IUGS uh, special panel on geo heritage, thinking how they can, if you, if you like, ferment some new organizations that can have the same status and standing as Conservation International and, and the like, or maybe even negotiate with these people to say, well, actually, if you're going to do a job on nature conservation, you better think about geodiversity and geo conservation. Brilliant. Okay, Roger, thank you very, very much. That was extremely interesting, very, very insightful. We uh, are going to move on. We're going to keep a tight ship here. And we're going to move on to Rachel, Rachel Paul, who's going to be talking about mapping, modelling and mining, 
a geological overview of the KOV or COV deposits in the Congolese copper belt. Um, I can't give you an introduction to your background, Rachel, because I'm afraid I don't know. I was Googling you just a second ago. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, hi there. So my name is Rachel Paul. Um, and until about 18 months ago, I worked as an open pit mine geologist at um, the COV deposit, um, which is in the DRC, in the, the um, Congolese Copper Belt in Central Africa. Um, so just on that note today, I'm going to, as I've been introduced, talking about the mapping, the modelling and the mining that we find there. So within this presentation, I'll give a quick summary of the regional geology. I'll look at the local geology we find there. I'll go over what we did in terms of mapping, modelling, and then a few other conclusions too. So to begin, so the Cov deposit is um, currently being mined by the Katanga Mining, which is a subsidiary of Glencore. It's a sedimentary hosted copper and cobalt stratiform deposit. So that means that mineralization is actually found within the sedimentary layers. It's located within the African Copper Belt. So that spans from Zambia into the DRC. And it's an open pit mine dominantly with seven different fragments. Katanga Mining itself actually own, um, we've got three open pits and we've got two underground mines. But for the purpose of today, I'll just focus on Kov, which is the largest of these three. It's been regionally mapped and explored since the 1800s with open pit mining beginning in the 1940s and then underground mining began in the 1950s. Both of these were by Jacquemines, which is a state-run company. And it was along the, process, the, the idea that they can actually mine for the general community to create jobs out there. So these are some of the minerals that we find within the open pit. It's dominantly oxide minerals. So the bottom two photos you can see, this is malachite. This is our copper, main copper oxide mineral. We've got chrysocolla on the bottom left, which is a pseudomorph of malachite. And we've got katanganite in the middle, which is slightly more rare. And then up at the top, that's sphalocobalite. That's our cobalt oxide mineral. And there's some native copper um, leaf shapes growing there too. So the pit's located in the DRC in Central Africa. It's in the Lualaba province, which is down in the southeast corner next to Zambia. The main town or city is called Kowesi, and the pit is called Kov. So the regional geology. The basement complex underlies the sedimentary hosted um, uh, deposit. And the basement complex is composed of granites, gneisses and bigmatites. We've got um, about 1.3 to 880 million years ago, we had extension and rifting between the Kalahari and the Congo Cretans, which created a shallow marine environment. Now this basement complex contains sulphide mineralization in the form of copper, cobalt and other sulphide minerals. Rivers eroded this basement rocks and they carried the mineralization into the water in the way of groundwater and by surface water too. This built up a sedimentary sequence composed of um, originally evaporites and limestones, which was then interbedded with carbonates and other classic continental material. And the sulphide mineralization was produced during diagenesis by bacteria. Overall, this created a seven kilometer thick sedimentary sequence. So we've got the Rhone group down the bottom, the Nugba group in the middle, and then the youngest Kundalini group on top. And about 600 to 500 million years ago, we had the Pan-African orogeny. This was continental collision between these two cratons. So we've got colliding of the Congo craton and the Kalahari craton. This produced crustal shortening and we had deformation of the foreland basin. So locally, this is known as the Katangan orogeny and within the Cov deposit itself, it's part of the Lithilian arc, which is a, fr a thrust fold belt. So what happened was we got naps that advanced from the south and this pushed up the underlying Rhone stratigraphy into the underlying Kundalundu stratigraphy. Now this happened, it's quite complex, but it was basically the, the idea of salt diapirs. 
So the basal unit of the Rhone is a, a type of evaporite, and this was pushed up into the younger rocks by salt diapirs. So we, in this form, we've got faults and folds at the anticline crests. Um, I've got various uh, fragments of the Rhone group that are all juxtaposed together within a sea of the Kundalundu group. Over millions of years, these rocks eroded um, and exposed the Rhone fragments at surface. And then we had supergene enrichment um, by a form of weathering that created from sulphides into oxide minerals. So that's the regional geology. On a local level, this is the stratigraphy that we see within the open pit. So the R1 group down at the bottom, you can see, this is the evaporite unit, which doesn't actually contain mineralization, but generally in the pit, whenever we see rocks next to this unit, they're highly mineralized. The OBS is our ore body inferior. This is silicified dolomites dominantly. We've got our RSC in the middle, which is our massive dolomitic unit, massive in texture, not in size. And then we've got our OBS, our ore body superior, which is dolomitic shales. So part of my job as open pit mine geologist was I was responsible for all the mapping. So we had, as I mentioned, we have three main open pits, but we began with COV, which is our um, main pit. So along with two of their colleagues, we mapped, we mapped all benches. Um, there was about 32 benches. Each bench is 10 metres high and the pits measures four by three kilometres. So it was quite a big size. And we went around mapping um, all the structural contacts, the lithology contacts and mark, mapping in folds and faults as well. We used compass clinos, um, taking dips and strikes and then plotted this on a paper map. So this is the paper map that you can see here. Um, it took over the office floor. It's about four by five uh, meters in size. And we created it on A4 paper maps that we took out into the pit and then joined these together um, with highly sophisticated sellotape back in the office. So this is a view from dispatch, which is the main central communication, looking out northwest over the pit. You can see here lots of different colours which represent um, the different lithology units and the different fragments. And it's been highly faulted and folded in between. Just for scale, there is a very small truck over on your left hand side. Um, this is a, a 793, so that's a 240 tonne haul truck. And there's a drill right in the middle of the pit. You can just see that's a blast hole drill rig, just the very far back. It's a blast hole drill rig. Um, which is about the size of a house. If I put the fragments on, these are five of the seven main fragments. And you can see how they're all juxtaposed together, um, all pushed apart, and obviously not, not how they're originally in place. Um, KOV, K-O-V, stands for the first three fragments that were discovered. So that's Komoto, Oliveira, Virgul. And Komoto stands for, in Swahili, it means little fire. And the story goes, was that the first exploration geologists back in the 1800s, when they were out here, they were looking for the malachite, the main oxide mineral. And they, um, it was getting cold, so they sat down and they lit a fire. And as they were lighting the fire, they could see the malachite reflecting in the firelight. Mm. And hence they gave it the name little fire. So now it's Komoto. Once I created the paper map, it got digitized as a 3D map onto the computer. Um, and here you can see it, we've got the black line, dotted line represents the faults, which is between the different fragments. And the green, blue and red represents the actual ore body unit that you can see. This mapping got combined with um, drill hole database to be able to create a lithology model. So the orange and purple line at the top is the surface mapping. The straight lines going down are diamond drill holes. These are actually up to two kilometers long. They're um, some pretty sizable drill holes. And then the purple and pink lines are the outline of the lithology, um, the ore body fragment. So the ore body fragment was then divided up by subunits. 
filled with blocks to make a 3D model. And then overlying waste units and underlying waste units were created as well. And in this way, it created a full 3D block model, which could be cut with sections to cover the entire pit. So if we just take one example section running north south through the middle of the pit, this is it here. So the, as I said, the, the sharp line you can see in the top is the surface mapping. We've got the drill holes, and then the faint line is the lithology model underneath. So in this way, you could actually see section by section what's happening on a geological scale. So it's useful for the exploration department because they can find out areas that we're not too confident about. So for example, the fragment variant, we've got lots of data actually closer to the pit, but slightly further away, that's an exploration target. We think the mineralization increases down there um, and there is, could be underground development potential there for the future, mm. but needs to be explored further. It's useful for my team, the production grade control guys, because it means on a short-term basis, we can decide where we're going to mine next. It's useful for the geotechnical teams because they can do slope stability analysis and do slide and dips using these models to look for potential faults and failures. And also for the hydrology department. If you can imagine, if you put a drill rig on top of this Oliveira fragment at the very surface and you drill downwards, the blue unit represents the RSC, that middle ore body unit. Now, this is our main aquifer for the pit. So if you know where this is, it means you can target it, drill into it, dewater, um, dewater the aquifer, and it will reduce the water going into the pit, which will help mining production. Mm. So the mapping has been updated in COV annually, and also in our satellite pit T17, and in another pit as well, Mashamba, which we all own too. And these have all since been modelled. So just to conclude, COV is a sedimentary hosted copper and cobalt deposit that's located in the African copper belt. I carried out geological mapping, which benefited multiple departments and related it to a lithology model, which has been annually updated. And then this model fed into the resource and reserve statements later on too. Mm. So thanks for listening. Don't know if there's any questions. Rachel, thank you very much. That was thoroughly interesting. And it's really good to get an insight of what industry actually does out in the field. Uh, from my experience in industry, I was just in an office. So you were lucky. Are there any questions? Yes, now, I've, uh, I've got one. <laughs> Probably a very simple question. How long did it take to do that mapping? Yeah, so it took a long time. Um, my, my main job was grade control geology. So that's the sam so drilling, sampling, taking samples to lab, and then making um, a day-to-day -day grade control plan. So we fitted the mapping around whenever we had time. So um, normally we went out about twice a week for half a morning. And COV took us the best part of a year to do. Um, T17 was about a month, and then Mashamba was about six months. We got a bit faster by that point. And there was, there was a gosh, labour of love. Yeah, labour of love. Um, it was quite an exciting project because at university you get to go out with your colouring pencils and make paper maps, but you don't normally imagine that you actually get to do it as a job as well. So when we got the chance to actually go out and make um, geological mapping on areas which hadn't necessarily been mapped before, it's been regionally well mapped, but not on a local scale. So it was really enjoyable. Thank you. I have a question, uh, uh, Rachel, um, and it's sort of, you know, people might, actually people might be shocked because I think geology, there's been male, female doing this, but I'm, you know, a young woman going out to the Congo to do this, and probably a lot of people on here wouldn't dare ask this, but I'm, I'm very much involved. Our company is a maths company, and we do a lot with trying to inspire young women to see that there are careers and things that they can embrace. Um, so what, what, you know, what, you know, I know it's so you, mining, it's open cast and it's what you studied, but can you share with me, it might be interesting to the others as well, but can, can you share, you know, what, what, you know, were you in, was it intrepid going out to do that? Oh, this is, you know, maybe a very 
you know, a very uh, sort of contentious question and people think, what the hell is she asking that for? But I just find it astounding that you you actually have done that. I'm not a geologist myself. I studied it at uni, but I, you know, I did safe things like go to France and Germany <laughs> to learn languages, but I didn't do this. So could you share that with us? Because I think that's fascinating as well, your own journey. Yeah, of course. Um, so I was out there for five and a half years. I came back about 18 months ago. Um, so yeah, I, I studied geology at uni and then did a math at St Andrews and then did a master's down at CSM down in Cornwall. Um, and from there, I wasn't really sure what exactly I was going to do. I had been out in California for a few months doing exploration gold mapping out there. Um, but I got offered this job and at the time mining was going through a bit of a bust cycle. So there weren't that many jobs around. Um, so kind of discussed it with the family and thought this was a, a, a kind of good shout. I mean, it's, it's not exploration as such, it is on a mine. So it is a fairly safe environment. Um, I mean, it is a third world country and obviously the DRC does have major problems, but you are quite well protected in the sense of there's the parent company of Glencore, which are looking after you. Um, you have a mixture of national workers and expat workers. So although the local language is Swahili and there's a lot of French, there's also English spoken in camp. Um, and you're given, uh, yeah, you've got a vehicle and you're given your dinner and that kind of stuff too. So we had a really good community, both with the other expats and also with the nationalese, um, the Congolese workforce too. It was a really good camaraderie. Um, and I, I love my time out there. It was a lot of ups and downs. Um, and I was actually quite sad to leave, but it was just time to come home back to Scotland. So I bet. Well, thank you. And I was going to say to, you know, as we're trying to all together to do the Scottish National Trust and inspire and, and raise excitement and awareness in the next generations, I think, you know, I don't want, I'm, I'm not being patronised and I really don't mean this. I genuinely mean there are lots of people like yourself and, and the, the, the careers. I mean, if I... I, you know, I know some of the folk that are in the in the uh, association, all the, the careers that you've had, it's, you know, I, I wish I had dropped French and German language and literature and studied geology more because, and I think people need to know that, that there are amazing experiences to be had. Um, so I would say, why don't we tap into, into that, you know, people like your own career, your own experience and the experiences of probably everybody on this, on this call, you know, as geologists, I think that's something that is, you know, very much hidden under a bushel. And I think if we told that, people would get very excited and the next generations would. Thank you for sharing it. I really enjoyed listening. Thank you very much. Uh, some good, insightful questions there as well. Um, I do believe it's now time for an interlude. Um, is Jason, Jason, oh, I think it's time for one more question. I think Wilf would like to ask. Wilf's put his hand up. Sorry, oh, sorry, my apologies. Yeah. Can I, can I just ask you what sort of software did you use for the modelling? Yes, of course. Um, so it was dominantly done in data mine. Um, obviously, the paper maps were done um, on paper, <laughs> um, put into Excel. Um, our database was GDMS, um, and then it was put into data mine. So we had a really good survey team that were serving the pit for production reasons every day. Um, so I was taking those, um, those topographies and then I could actually, using the commands in data mine, create strings and then transpose them onto the 3D um, survey topography to create the 3D model. So it meant you could, almost similar to Google Maps, what you can do now, you could zoom in on the lithology, um, rotate yourself around and then actually see the, the rocks in real life in front of you on the model. So yeah, data mine was fantastic for that purpose. So, so what, how did you position yourself? Was it just just with a compass intersection? Yep, so we used GPS. We had handheld GPS, which okay. was accurate to five meters, um, which for the scale that we we're working on, five meters was fine. Um, if there were any faults that we thought were particularly important, we would get the survey guys down, we'd mark it with spray paint, and they'd give us an accurate to like 10 centimeter accuracy, um, handheld or the, the probe GPS. Um, and then actually on the computer, we would upload the GPS um, into Excel and then Excel into uh, data mine. Any more questions? Thank you. I was going to ask something. Did your study or your survey <clears throat> enable the mine 
company to uh, produce any sort of um, information or data on the life of the mines, for example, or um, you know how, how you know how much further are they going to be able to go with these mines? Did, did that come up at all? Yes, it did. So um, not so much in the mapping. So the mapping from the mapping, we would create the I would create the lithology model for the open pits. And my colleague was um, Susanna was doing the same for the underground workings. Um, and we had a chief resource and exploration geologist. So he would take our lithology models and he would use ordinary Kruging um, to actually take the drill hole results and apply QAQC and everything else um, and create the reserve statement. And then from that, he could create the life of mine plan. Um, so our models were showing that there was, I, th I think actually for the open pit, our mi the mineralization was double what we originally thought. Um, but that is from, a lot of that was quite historic drill holes that were from the 60s and 70s. So there's no QAQC, quality assurance, quality control, um, in the form of standards and blanks, which were associated with that data. So that can't be reported in terms of resource and reserves. Um, but at least it was showing that from an exploration target point of view, there's more places that we could, you can drill and potentially the mineralization is much bigger than we originally thought. So, I mean, Cov, Cov's a huge deposit. It's the second highest grade open pit copper mine in the world. And right. by reserves, I think it's one of the highest. Um, so it's, it's got the potential to be much bigger in the future. I mean, is it, is it, is it producing any sort of... Um... Is it producing an uptick in the standard of life, for example, of the locals, or is it all going to the government, do you think? No, it's it's doing both. Um, I mean, obviously, the government do take quite a big cut, um, mm. and then obviously it does benefit the mine companies too. But the national workforce, there's um, there's quite a big incentive. They get um, accommodation and healthcare and schooling, um, and then a lot of their profits from the mining companies go to local communities, and support uh, projects within the community themselves too. So it benefits the national workforce, but also the community. Um, That's great. Probably, probably not as much as the government, but it is still helping. That's good to hear, yeah. Thank you. Is there, is there any more processing in the area? Y yes, so um, we've got the open pits, the underground, and the processing plant. So it's solvent extraction, electro winning, um, and yeah, there's, I can't remember them all. Um, yeah, w, um, SX and EW are the main processing plants that are around processing for copper and cobalt. I wonder if when it's uh, finished, whether that sort of site would make uh, for a good area for geoconservation exposing that type of ore body um, just to link in with Roger's talk previously and uh, I think maybe I, I very much doubt the industry is thinking about that and uh, very very much doubt that the Congolese government is thinking about that but maybe with some of the suggestions that Roger was making a bit of pressure could be put on for that. Right unless there are any more questions Okay. Then I, I just do... comment on that point. Oh, yeah, yeah, why not? Tom, um, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a classic example of where uh, exposures in a quarry will uh, enable new evidence to come to light, which wasn't there before. And how do you protect uh, these areas once once it's uh, covered over and there's lots of different ways of, of, of doing it. Some places you want to hide it away and only dig it out for special reasons. Uh, other, other times you want to leave the faces as clear as possible and there are lots of different ways of doing it and lots of experience around the world. Yep, I, I mean Spire Slack here in uh, Scotland is a very good, good case of that I think and uh, <clears throat> Graham could give us a talk all about the geoconservation value of spires slack. So, um, right, there will be time for discussion afterwards. So I do suggest now that we move on to our interlude.